I like to think that I'm quite used to annoying cartoon concepts. Trust me, I've had a short and relatively uneventful life this far, so it's not like I've seen a lifetime worth of cartoons or anything. However, considering how long I've been entrenched in this medium, I've probably seen thousands of hours worth of animated content on and off. Despite my generalized taste, there's not too much I haven't seen yet. Then again, that might be an implicit unknown unknown, so I might be heavily desensitized to things that might set others off automatically. Gutsy gore, extreme gross out, over animated sexual debauchery, general annoyance, trite storytelling cliches, the list goes on and the beat lives on longer. It doesn't exactly excuse when those elements are implemented poorly, but generally, they don't bother me too much. I notice, however, that when I stumble upon a series that can deliver a genuinely fresh new perspective on things, it can flip my whole worldview upside down. Of course, perspective is subjective, so when I find something that actually can execute a concept in a way that's seldom seen and seldom perfected, suddenly all those quirky little imperfections just become a bit more irksome. And I start to think, why couldn't they go the extra mile and subvert this story beat? And maybe there was a scene that would have had extra weight to it without being scored. Sometimes the ideal series says a hell of a lot without saying much at all. I think animation can be especially guilty of this because we've embraced this subjectivity of enjoying them carte blanche. It's still widely considered a children's medium, so the logic that follows is there's either a clear structure or none at all. Whether you want to make children's brain melt or make them memorize math tables, there are clear schools of thought established regarding how to teach the alleged target audience. Despite this, and according to thousands of reviews and retrospectives, many cartoons are unbelievably frustrating, either due to how they crash and burn spectacularly, or just narrowly miss the mark. So it's a beautiful thing, really, when a series can just blow everything else. Say what? So being the first to cover one would in fact be a hell of a feat to accomplish. In this regard, I'd wish to be the first to discuss that topic today, but that's not gonna happen. That being said, number two ain't a bad spot to be in. I'd still have a lot of great material to talk about. That being said, I wouldn't be covering at all if not for number one over here. Though, even if this Maverick didn't cover this series at all, I wouldn't be the first one to bemoan its general obscurity. I don't disagree with this statement, but it could apply to many, many more animations. What compelled him to apply it to this series? Well, that question would be answered shortly thereafter with this statement. What a ringing endorsement for such a low-key series. Upon screening, I can safely say, do concur with our boy over here keeping up with the classics. Unfortunately, his channel was yeeted into the Shadow Realm long ago, never to be seen again. The only reason why I'm bringing this to you now is because it was re-uploaded. This specific review. But his legacy lives on, which is why this video exists. It can be summed up better by people of similarly eloquent yet significantly less wordy verbiage to myself. So that's all well and good, but 
What is Fred's head about, really? Well, the series' focus lies squarely on his title character, 16-year-old Fred LeBlanc, as he navigates adolescence around a compendium of complex situations and a menagerie of quirky characters with a naturally nonchalant perspective, hence the original French title, Blaise Le Blasé. Fred's head stands out to me as that ideal series, and not only because its protagonist can be a man of few words. Sometimes you can finish an episode without realizing how it fits into the whole arc until the next. It's brilliant, it's complex, and surprisingly insightful. So in the spirit of the show itself, I'm going to try my hardest to touch on everything without drafting a dissertation. Upon reflection, there are many, many opportunities to go ham in scripting and extend the length of this video just by going into the technical aspects alone. But I question how far that'll go if retention stays low enough that no one gets to the real insight. After all, the meat of this video should be getting into the psychology of the show as well as the course of events seen through the series' singular multi-pronged arc. Can I possibly pass up the chance to talk about one of the most realistic portrayals of adolescence in modern animation to prattle on for 20 minutes about character design alone? So in the immortal words of Philip DeFranco, let's just jump into it. If there had to be one word to describe this series, I'd probably choose representational. Every single choice made during production contributes to representing all possible sides of the main character. That is, every aspect of production can possibly be linked back to how it's used to portray Fred's point of view. The series operates from this perspective, but it's not strictly stuck with him in frame all the time, which leaves a lot of room to focus on the eccentric character lineup. Despite the extensive collection of supporting roles, most of them stand out when they need to and serve to bolster the main characters. The mains and a few of the supporting roles usually give you a bit to think about by episode's end, but that's not always the case. Despite their varying amounts of developmental depth, all tie into the story at large to the central narrative presented. The extent of how one note or exaggerated a character is can be attributed to the central presentation of the world through Fred's head. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! His connection to how he sees certain characters and explored in brief imaginative sequences seeded in various episodes, which help illustrate the vividly eclectic world further highlighted by the art direction and animation. This show utilizes rather simply rigged flash animation and a minimalist bold art style to bring this world to life. Despite its limited animation, it's one of the better uses of such a technique, especially considering the manner of which it was applied. The bold art style gives the impression of a graphic influence, and I like to think it's in keeping with the tone. The colorist and the layout artist really got a chance to shine throughout this series in rather unexpected ways. Both of these attributes help nail the tone of the show. The punk rock score really helps cement the aesthetic of the show too. It's rugged, but it's not too harsh. Believe it or not, the full score is out there compiled in five parts, which I highly recommend giving a listen to. The theme song produced by Les Trois Accords is a perfect indicator of what you'll be getting into with this series. I tend to slightly prefer the Quebecois version over the dubbed English, but both are well produced, so you wouldn't be missing out either way. Speaking of which, the English and the French translations are both masterfully done. Being a Canadian-French co-production, these two languages are the predominant dubs that represent Fred's head. The animation seems to have been done in the original French dialogue as the lip sync noticeably matches the dub much better than the English. My dear Fred, I am delighted to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about yourself. You have a quick temper. Mm. Your pent-up rage is palpable and irrational. La colère vous ronge l'hypothalamus. Avouez ou je ne réponds plus de moi. OK, j'avoue. Hypothèse illustrée de façon magistrale. The latter has excellent timing and it draws on some of the best talent in the Quebecois voice acting community. But as with most dubs, the original just hits on everything best. I have to say though, I think the English is one of the most well done dubbing jobs I've seen in Western animation. The dialogue is clever, tight, and beautifully timed. It refuses to dilute any of the cynical, slightly edgy theming or character exclamations, which really helps strengthen the identity of the show. Of course, the experienced voice actors also tie everything in together. 
I hear they were pretty popular during award season that year. Amazingly enough, the protagonist of the English dub is voiced by presumably a newcomer to VA work, but gave Fred the right sound regardless. In my book, both Freds are pretty much interchangeable in quality. I have to believe that's partially attributed to the level of cohesion that could have existed between the production companies. I noticed that co-productions between France and French Canada tend to be tighter products overall, which is definitely bolstered by the existence of this series. If you can get through it, I definitely recommend watching the series in both languages to get the full experience, or even if you just like this show, buying the full DVD release, which is only available in French, so just get it imported, you mooks. What do you want? If you somehow already were familiar with both dubs, then you probably already have some insight into the series structure. Fred's Head has one main overarching story that persists throughout the whole season. It's far from the only focus of the show, and many of the main and supporting characters get fleshed out enough to appreciate them. Though most, if not all, episodes are roughly self-contained and won't be detrimental to jump in at any point, you gain so much more by watching it from the beginning onward. If you're unsure, it might be best to start from anywhere in the first half of the show, watch through part one completely, and finish the second half in order. There's a lot to learn about the characters in such little time. By the last episode, there's no major question left to be unanswered, but you could probably go for an extra season to see how the characters got by. In fact, it's implied by the creators that the second season would have indeed delved deeper in character attributes that were touched upon in the first, and to date, only produced season. The characters themselves are rather engaging. Whether they're at the center of the A plot, the B plot, or something in between, there's always something else to learn about them. In their most basic forms, they do encompass typical high school stereotypes. The relationships they have and the development they get from it tend to be anything but. The slightly cynical tone makes for a good deconstruction of the typical baseline stereotypes and does a good job of adding an extra twist on most of them, of which the best example is perhaps Fred himself. He's outwardly moody and nonplussed, but that doesn't stop him from having friends of all types. He's mature and slightly cynical, but it doesn't stop him from being an outgoing, friendly, helpful member of society. The dichotomy of faces represented at St. Jude's is one of the most realistic portrayals of high school life out there. That's not to say the common image is necessarily wrong either. After all, stereotypes are usually born out of a touch of exaggerated truth. However, the way it's portrayed in Fred's head is a refreshing take on a well-exhausted concept in media, especially for a network that has catered to such a genre well into the past. One of Fred's head's most valuable aspects would have to be its realism. That's not necessarily linked to how grounded it is, though most of the events of the series are things that can happen to your average teen with a touch of suspended belief. It's the way it does portray this world. It's brazen disregard for the normal stakes and tone of its ilk and go into everything it can. Frankly, it, it was a bit of a brave move for Teletoon to let it ride as is, though with classics such as What's With Andy and Braceface in its library testing the boundaries in similar ways, maybe it shouldn't be so much of a surprise. That Caution 8 rating can really stretch far, but not far enough to give the show an American release. No! Unacceptable! The plethora of more mature subject matter most likely held it back from that sweet, sweet prime time slot on Cartoon Network. The decidedly edgiest of the big three. Originally, there was also like a little super cut of all of the mature stuff they talk about, so I'll probably include one here. pretty girl tell me I don't mean to be forward I was watching you and I was wondering is there anyone in particular that you've got your eye on in this park yeah <laughs> We have to deal with your problem. I'll help you. What problem? My problem's solved. Don't play dumb with me. I know everything, Fred. Madam Butterfly saw it all in her rice. The granular substance, the red eyes, the bad influences. You're not serious, Mother. You don't think I was taking... Don't say it! 
and don't deny it. Though, of course, everything's about the execution, what really strikes me about Fred's head is its attitude and the manner of which it does tackle the world it inhabits. It doesn't drive itself to tell you anything grand or verbose regarding the complexity of teenage life. It tells you a few things, but only because it can show you the world. It does embrace its simplicity, and it makes for a very meaningful interpretation out of it. There's a lot more wisdom to this series than just Fred's small pieces of advice at the end of each episode. So... What words of wisdom can I tell you today? I notice more so now than ever, animation fans are rushing to crown the next Gravity Falls or the next Adventure Time, which, if thought of, carries some unfortunate implications to it. If we're constantly framing all of our more ambitious animated series as just a take on something from the past, it carries the implication that the new stuff can't have its own identity. Everything's a little derivative, but the constant branding of other shows wholly as well-like series from our past will only set everybody up for disappointment, possibly tainting its perception forever and keeping people from giving it a watch. Granted, a lot of those statements normally come from a place of, I want to see more of that, but it comes across more as, we only need that, which either way probably isn't the way to go about things. There will always be time for new projects and universal favorites to raise the bar. Oftentimes, it's not those who try to follow trends that become successful, it's those that set them by doing their own thing. We need a diversity of vision in order to inspire the next generation of animators to make something as the best of this decade. And in that vein, Fred's head is highly inspirational because of its ability to tell such a realistic and compelling story without borrowing much in the way of cliche familiarity. Actually, I think Fred describes this series as accurately as possible. I think, therefore I am. But I'm not always what I think. Fred's head was not made to be groundbreaking or a fantastical epic. It comes and leaves doing exactly what it needs to, and in that way, it can actually be pretty groundbreaking in and of itself. It's a relatively modern gem of the Teletoon Library, and it's one of the greatest animated series I've gotten the pleasure to watch. Check it out. Whole series is on YouTube in English and in French. Scope out that DVD, scope out that SoundCloud, <laughs> that soundtrack, and uh, just give it some love. Communicating can sometimes feel painful when coupled.